Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, thank you so much for joining us today for this national webinar from Gordon Food Service Canada. Today's topic is the importance of food safety in a healthcare food ser service operation, or what you need to know about food safety. My name is Kayla King, and I'm a regional dietitian for the Gordon Food Service Nutrition Resource Center. Just for your information, all attendees are muted for the duration of the session. However, you can type in questions in the GoTo panel, and I will address as many as I can at the end of the session. So your question and mention which province you are from, and I'll address it that way. There are some handouts available to download as well in the GoToWebinar panel. Please feel free to download them now or at your convenience. Also, if you have to walk away at any time, please know that this session is being recorded. So if you must need to see this at a later date, we can send this recording to you. So here's the agenda for today's presentation. We will cover why food safety is important, the types of food safety hazards, cross-contamination, time and temperature control, the flow of food, personal hygiene, cleaning and sanitation, outbreak procedures, and finally some resources and best practices. The objectives of this presentation are to really focus on the importance of food safety in a healthcare food service environment, and I will use a lot of practical examples. Also, it's to provide a very general overview of food safety practices, and that's because there really is only so much that we can cover in such a short period of time. Lastly, we want to explore some available tools and best practices for continuous staff education. I also wanted to note that this is only a one hour educational webinar. It does not replace official food handlers or food safety training and no official food safety certification will be issued at the end of this session. It does count, however, for CE points for CSNM. So I just wanted to start first of all with a poll. So if you could just let me know, where do you work? So it looks like most of them are long-term care homes, but there's also hospitals as well as retirement community and also some other. And I'm sure as well, there might be a mix of people who work in communities that cover all types of these areas. So thanks for joining today. Okay. So let's talk about food safety, why it's important, as well as research on training. While it may seem that food safety practices are really just another rule that needs to be followed, food safety is important because it helps minimize the risk of foodborne illness or food poisoning. Common symptoms of foodborne illness can include vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, fever, and chills. Foodborne illness is a serious concern for vulnerable populations because it can lead to long-term complications and even death. Vulnerable populations include adults 60 years and older, pregnant women, individuals with weakened immune systems, and children's ages five and under. For adults 60 years and older, it becomes harder for our immune systems to fight off harmful bacteria as we age. While most people affected by food poisoning can really recover completely, serious longer term health effects, including conditions such as kidney failure and anemia, are more common in older adults. For pregnant women, both mom and the unborn baby are at increased risk of food poisoning because all of the changes taking place during pregnancy. Some conditions as well as treatment for certain illnesses such as cancer can affect your immune system. This can make it very difficult to fight off foodborne bacteria and this situa situation can lead to very serious complications. Children's ages five and under are at increased risk of food poisoning and this is because their immune systems are still developing and they're unable to fight off infection as well as adults can. 
young children also produce less of the stomach acid that kills harmful bacteria, which makes it easier for them to get sick. In fact, a family member of mine very tragically got ill from E. coli poisoning at the age of two. It was uncertain what the source was that caused the illness, but it forever changed her life. Her family members likely didn't get ill because they were all older and had a more developed immune system. To this day, she is unable to walk, talk, or eat food on her own, all because of a foodborne illness. So this is certainly why it is important to follow food safety procedures. As well, healthcare facilities, which is where most of you work, often serve vulnerable populations. Hospitals may serve all of these. Um, Long-term care facilities and retirement communities certainly have adults 60 years and older. And some of those individuals may be going through treatments such as cancer treatment, which will weaken their immune system. So it's really important to know that these are the people that it is most concerned of, even though you and I might have not gotten food poisoning before and have done some maybe some unsafe food practices, it doesn't mean that the same would happen for them. So just briefly, when it comes to food safety laws, there are federal laws in place which govern, govern food safety compliance and healthcare food service. And each province has different regulations for the requirements of food safety training. If you're interested in learning more about what is required in your province, you can go to foodsafety.ca where they have a list of law requirements by location. It's important to note that some provinces require that you only need food safety training once, such as maybe in Quebec, while others require every three to five years. We at GFS have actually decided to move to an annual food safety training for our warehouse and transportation crew because we see the importance of continuous education. But what I wanted to point out is when you're looking at the research in regards to food safety training and staff attitudes, there is one thing that really stood out. When food service workers in a long-term care facility were surveyed on their knowledge and attitudes related to food safety, the results showed that while most had at least one course in food safety and hygiene, it was actually not enough to influence day-to-day -day behaviors in the workplace. I really think this is important to know because it demonstrates that the amount of training is important, but also that there are supports that are needed within the organization to support daily food safe practices. Today, we hope to provide a few tips for building food safety into your organization's culture after a brief overview of some food safe principles. So let's review. Any food can become contaminated. However, there are foods that are likely to be more become more contaminated than, the, um, than others. And these are potentially hazardous foods and ready to eat foods. Potentially hazardous foods <clears throat> are any perishable foods that support the growth of harmful microorganisms. They are usually high moisture, high protein foods, but there are some others that may also be very high risk. Potentially hazardous foods include milk products, shell eggs, beef, chicken, pork, fish, lamb, shellfish, soy products, sliced melon, rice, tofu, garlic and oil emulsions, bean sprouts, and soups and stews. Aside from potentially hazardous food, another concern is when ready-to-eat foods become contaminated through what's called cross-contamination. Cross-contamination is when a ready-to-eat food, as I said, comes in contact with a food safety hazard. Look at this photo. Has anyone ever been told that they should wash a chicken or turkey prior to preparing it? Well, this is not a food safe practice. It is very easy to spread bacteria that is naturally present on the raw products. In this example, we see that any water that has touched the chicken has now splashed onto the person in their apron, the paper towel in the sink, as well as some ready to eat foods such as cheese, tomato, and lettuce. If someone consumes these ready-to-eat foods or spreads bacteria again from their apron or touching the sink or the paper towel, someone can very easily get food poisoning. And the worst part is it likely goes unnoticed as it's easy not to be able to see, smell, or taste when something has been contaminated. Hence why this is an x-ray vision picture. So there are a few different ways how food can become contaminated. There are biological hazards, which are living organisms that can multiply and grow. We will go through some detailed examples next. There are also chemical hazards, which are to toxic substances that can occur naturally or be introduced to food. This includes chemical products or cleaning supplies in your kitchen and dining rooms that may come in 
contact with food, either from cleaning your surface with a chemical and not letting it fully dry before placing food in that area, or through mislabeling a product and placing an area with commonly used product might be like, say, the canola oil. Definitely do not place chemicals in empty food can containers for this reason. Chemical hazards can also result when a food is placed in a, a vessel that is not food safe. For example, there was a group of teens at a party in California that got zinc poisoning when a punch was made in a galvanized tub. This is because the zinc in the container leached into the drink, which was then consumed by multiple people at the party. Lastly, there are physical hazards, which can be glass, debris, hair, nails, staples from packaging, or anything that can accidentally get into food. This is also why we do not scoop ice using a glass cup in the ice machine, as it can break and then contaminate all of the ice. Personal hygiene practices, dress codes, and other rules around personal appearance are also usually in place to minimize the risk of physical hazards. But let's take a closer look at biological hazards as they can be very complex. There are four main types of biological hazards. They include bacteria, viruses, parasites, and fungi. Bacteria can be found just about everywhere. Some bacteria are good, like the ones found in yogurt, but others can cause disease. These bacteria are called pathogens. Pathogens can be found in human and animal waste, soil, or in raw meat, poultry, and fish. Viruses cannot survive on their own, but they can grow and cause foodborne illness once they are concerned by a person or an animal. Viruses can hang out in contaminated water and can spread from person to person when someone is infected. Examples that you may not know are foodborne illnesses are norovirus or norwalk and hepatitis A. Parasites are living organisms that live in or on other organisms such as animals or humans. They can also hang out in contaminated water and can pr be present in certain potentially hazardous foods as well. Examples of this can include ringworm and tapeworm. Lastly, fungi can be very small or very large microorganisms. Like bacteria, some are okay to eat, such as certain kinds of mushrooms and the molds that are in blue cheese, but others can be harmful when consumed. Some even pro produce toxins, which can be fatal, such as those found in some poisonous mushroom varieties. But let's take a closer look at bacteria and viruses. When it comes to bacteria, some examples include E. coli, Salmonella, Staphylococcus aureus, or Staph, Campylobacter, Clostridium botulinum, or botulism, Clostridium perfringens, Listeria monocytogenes, Shigella, and Bacillus cereus. These bacteria can cause foodborne illness in a few different ways. They can cause infections, which is when you consume the harmful bacteria. They can cause intoxication when you consume a toxin formed by a bacteria. And they can also cause toxin-mediated infections, which is when you consume the harmful bacteria and it then proceeds to produce toxins after being ingested. I wanted to highlight Bacillus cereus. It's commonly found in starchy foods such as rice and potatoes. Bacillus cereus can actually form spores, which can survive the process of cooking. These spores can cause intoxication, which can result in vomiting within 30 minutes to 6 hours. These toxins form quickly when rice is left within the temperature danger zone for too long, and this could be room temperature. Fried rice is often a source of foodborne illness as it requires cooking rice, cooling it down, and then reheating it with other ingredients. Even if the rice is reheated to the proper internal temperature, it can still cause illness due to spore formation. Bacillus cereus can also cause a toxin-mediated infection, which results in diarrhea between 6 and 15 hours later. This, however, is normally destroyed in the cooking process, but it definitely goes to show how one bacterium can cause a lot of problems. And I bet you didn't know that rice could be so dangerous. So just talking about Bacillus cereus, you'll likely start to understand that bacteria need some favorable conditions to grow. These conditions follow the acronym FAT-TOM. F stands for food, so the type of food matters. High-protein foods can already be contaminated when received, and they're also at risk of being contaminated during the flow of food. A stands for acidity. 
Acidity is measured on a pH scale of 0, which is very acidic, to 14, which is very alkaline or basic, whereas 7 is neutral. Most bacteria favor a pH between 4.6 and 7.5. The first T stands for time. It takes time for pathogens to grow to levels that cause harm. At room temperature or 20 degrees Celsius, bacteria can double every 10 to 20 minutes. Therefore, within two to four hours, there can be enough pathogens present to cause illness. The second T stands for temperature. The temperature danger zone for potentially hazardous food is between four degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. It's important to keep food out of this temperature range as much as possible as it favors rapid bacterial growth. O stands for oxygen. Some bacteria need oxygen to grow, but it isn't always necessary. M stands for moisture. Foods with high moisture levels are more likely to support bacterial growth. Moisture in foods can be reduced by freezing, dehydrating, adding sugar or salt, or cooking to help decrease this risk. This is why some foods with very low moisture contents can be kept at room temperature, such as dried beans. Another biological hazard that I wanted to highlight is viruses. As I mentioned, viruses cannot survive on their own, but once they are ingested, they can cause illness. Two common examples that you may have heard of are norovirus or Norwalk and hepatitis A. These viruses can be particularly difficult to manage, especially in a healthcare facility, as something like nor norovirus is highly contagious and it takes very little to get someone sick. It's also very easy to pass from one person to another through contact with body fluids. Anyone who has had norovirus also knows that you certainly do not want it. The best defense against foodborne illness is good personal hygiene. Now that we reviewed the different types of biological hazards, I would like to discuss how biological hazards are spread. There are four main categories, animals, people, soil, and water. When it comes to animals, this can mean animal products, such as raw meat, poultry, and fish, as they can be sources of bacteria, such as E. coli, Salmonella, and Campylobacter, which is, this is why it's very important to always wash your hands and sanitize surfaces and equipment. Insects and mice can also carry bacteria and viruses on their bodies, which is why they are one of the first things that health inspectors look for. Make sure you have regular visits from a pest control officer and always call them immediately if you notice any signs of vermin. People are also a source of spreading biological hazards. It can come from a human intestinal tract, and this is usually occurs when a food service worker does not properly wash their hands after using the bathroom and then touches food, surfaces, or other people. This is referred to as the fecal oral and I know some of you probably just grimaced at that fact, but it is actually very common. This is why you should send home employees who are ill, because if someone is constantly back and forth to the bathroom, the likelihood of this happening is very high. Cross-contamination, as we mentioned before, can often result, be a result of staff not washing their hands properly or not washing their hands enough and touching ready-to-eat food, surfaces, or other people. This is why it's important to practice proper hand washing techniques and to conduct hand washing audits to ensure that everyone is following the procedure. Lastly, it's very common for us to have bacteria such as Staphylococcus aureus on our skin. We also have good bacteria that lives on our skin that can protect us. But sometimes this bacteria living in our skin, in our nose, or infected cuts and sores can contaminate food through coughing, sneezing, and touching food. This is why there are sneeze guides in many buffet lines, and also why staff members are asked to cover their cuts and wear gloves. If the cut cannot be properly covered, it's really best to send that employee home. Biological hazards can also spread through soil or water. Soil can contain pathogenic bacteria naturally, but it can also be in introduced to the, <clears throat> the soil through fertilizers, such as manure from animal waste. Contaminated water from sources such as lakes and streams also can contain harmful levels of microorganisms. This is why it's always important to use potable water for any food service activity and always adhere to boil water advisories. Next, we'll talk about controlling food hazards. We know a lot about the type and the source of food safety hazards, but what can we do to control them? Time and temperature control is extremely important as, as it's one of the biggest contributing factors to foodborne illness. 
This is because, as we discussed earlier, there are certain temperatures and time frames which favors bacterial growth. The temperature danger zone favors this rapid bacterial, bacterial growth. It is between 4 and 60 degrees Celsius or 40 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. When it comes to time, food must not spend more than four hours in the temperature danger zone. This is because bacteria grows rapidly, as I said, doubling in amount every 10 to 15 minutes, so harmful levels can accumulate within two to four hours. Knowing this, there are actually many instances where it will be important to keep food out of this range throughout the entire flow of food, which we'll discuss next. Sometimes this is referred to as cold chain management. The flow of food describes the entire lifespan of a food product from the second it arrives at your facility to being discarded. Each step of the flow of food has many important steps to help minimize foodborne illness. Let's take a look at each step more closely. When it comes to receiving your food at your facility, there are a few things to consider. This by no means cover everything you need to check when receiving food. It can actually be a quite an extensive list, but here I've included a few key points. Before the food is ordered, be sure to only buy food from an approved inspected sources. When the food arrives, be very diligent to inspect all incoming food for damaged boxes, leaking cans, and dented cans, and don't be afraid to send it back with the supplier. It's also a good idea to inspect the truck upon arrival. Ask questions about anything you see. Make sure everything looks clean and is operating properly. Ensure your food comes on a temperature controlled vehicle. Again, you wanna keep food within a safe temperature range. You can always ask for temperature log reports of trucks to be sure that the temperature remained at a safe level for the duration of the trip. When storing foods, there are considerations for dry storage, freezer storage, and cooler storage. I will go over a few key points here. First, it's important to check the expiry date on products. Some products have expiry dates, some have used by dates, others have manufactured on dates. Some vendors also use what's called the Julian cal calendar to date stamp their products. If you have any questions about expiry dates, you can always contact us at Gordon Food Service, and sometimes you can contact the vendor directly as they sometimes include their phone number on the packaging. Any food product that is opened or prepared in the kitchen should have a date and name label. It's important to know what certain products are, as well as when they were prepared so that food can be discarded appropriately. It's also important to practice first in, first out to avoid costly food waste from food spoilage. In the cooler, it's important to store foods in the right place. Ready to eat food should be placed at the top of the fridge. This has helped to reduce the risk of cross-contamination from raw products potentially dripping on them. It's a good practice to place items in order from lowest internal temperature to highest internal temperature at the very bottom. This is because if one product does happen to drip down to another, the food will eventually be cooked to a high enough internal temperature to hopefully destroy any potential pathogens. However, you want to eliminate dripping as much as possible. Another thing that inspectors ensure is that all products are covered. This is again to prevent cross-contamination. Lastly, another good tip when it comes to storage is ensure that you only use food safe containers to store opened or prepared food. This can help prevent chemical hazards from unintentionally leaching into food. Preparing foods both includes defrosting products as well as prepping products for cooking. When it comes to defrosting, there are four ways to properly defrost a food. In a refrigerator at four degrees or lower, completely submerged under running water at 21 degrees Celsius or lower. As part of the cooking process, so if you put it in a cooking vessel and continue to cook it all the way through to the final internal temperature, and in a microwave. It's certainly not recommended to defrost large items in a microwave as it's likely not very effective. Although it's very commonplace to defrost, say, a turkey in the sink filled with water overnight on many Thanksgivings, it's really not a food safe practice, and you could be putting your dinner guests at risk. When preparing items for cooking, especially when mincing or pureeing products for texture modified diets in a healthcare facility, you want to make sure you're not taking too long within the temperature danger zone. You want to make sure that food items remain above 60 degrees Celsius for hot food or below 4 degrees Celsius for cold food. And be aware that sometimes the blade of the machines can heat up the cold food during, um, during preparation due to the friction. It's also important to ensure that all the ingredients are the same temperature. 
For example, when processing a hot item for, say, a minced diet, adding cold broth can quickly bring down the temperature. So just something to be mindful of. When it comes to cooking, you always want to cook foods to their minimum safe internal temperature or higher, if as long as it doesn't compromise the quality. Always measure the internal temperature with a thermometer and make sure your thermometers are calibrated. Measure in more than one place. So for example, a turkey, you might want to measure the breast meat as well as the leg and thigh meat and make sure you're not touching a bone. When it's something like a tray of chicken breast, you might want to choose the largest food item versus the smallest. If you take the temperature of the smallest food item and that one is at the proper temperature, that doesn't mean that the larger items on that tray will be also at that safe temperature. As you may have figured, larger items take longer to cook. So always choose the largest food, take that temperature if it's within proper range, then it's very likely that the smaller ones are too. However, it wouldn't hurt to take the temperature of multiple food samples. Also, do not partially cook food to complete cooking at a later time. You may be bringing it up to, say, a within the temperature danger zone and then leaving it in that area. So certainly not a good practice. When it comes to holding food, especially hot holding food, Hot food should remain above 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. You also want to check the internal temperature of food every two hours and mark this into a temperature log. If during a check, the temperature of hot food drops below 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit, there's a few things that you can do. You want to consume this food within two hours or discard, certainly discard after that two hour period. You want to cool the food properly and then store the food below 4 degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Fahrenheit or reheat it to 160 degrees Fahrenheit or 74 degrees Celsius, but only do this once and I'll explain that in a minute. Cooling food is also a very important step. Once food has been cooked, you really want to ensure you cool it properly. Food must be cooled from 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit to four degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Fahrenheit within four to six hours. And there's a process for this. So you might wanna start by checking the internal temperature of the food, making sure that it gets from 60 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius in two hours. So this could be at room temperature on the counter. Then you wanna make sure that it gets from 20 degrees Celsius to four degrees Celsius within four hours. So this would be taking it from the counter putting it into the fridge, and then making sure the food is kept below four degrees Celsius. Sorry, my sign is backwards there. Placing really hot food items in a standard fridge and freezer can actually raise the temperature of the entire unit and actually puts other food items at risk. So if you have a giant pot of steaming hot stew and you put it in your fridge, this can actually raise the temperature and all the other food items are now being put within the temperature danger zone. Of course, a large item such as a large refrigerator, a large freezer, blast chiller, you may not have this issue, but it's something to be aware of, especially if you have smaller fridges and freezers in your serving areas. As well, it's not very effective to have a large quantity like a large pot of stew trying to cool because it likely will not cool within the time frame that is required. You might want to use something like an ice wand, which is um, a plastic wand filled with ice that you can then stir and release some of the heat. You can put the, the container over an ice bath and also continue to stir to release some heat. But really the best way to do it is place the food into much smaller containers. I often do this as well when I cook dinner. I, afterwards, I take it out of the pot and I put it in multiple small containers to cool on time. This kind of goes to holding cold food. So cold foods must remain at four degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Fahrenheit or below. You all often want to check the refrigerator temperatures as well, because if the fridge temperature is not below four degrees Celsius, you have to check the internal temperature of the food and take some corrective action. If, at, if the food is at four degrees Celsius or below, you want to take these food items and move them to another fridge immediately. They're still safe. 
but if the foods are at four degrees Celsius or above, you really need to discard these products because you're not sure of how long they were held within this temperature danger zone. Reheating is something that's also so can be a concern during the flow of food. You want to reheat all previously cooked foods to an internal temperature of 74 degrees Celsius or 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Food must also be reheated to this recommended internal temperature within two hours. So you can't take a really long time to bring food up to this temperature because it's hanging out in the temperature danger zone for too long. So if you can't do it within two hours, you should discard the food. You also want to reheat the food only once, as each time food is reheated, it passes through the temperature danger zone. This is why some healthcare facilities actually have this as a policy. So which is you need to be mindful of is when you're cooking a roast beef overnight, cooling it, slicing it, and then reheating it for service. If someone misses that meal service and the food cools down, you may not be able to reheat it for them because you're then reheating it twice. Food is also still at being at risk and contaminated during service. So if just from some quick tips for this is to use properly clean and sanitize utensils and dishes. Practice good personal hygiene as a server. Be careful where you hold plates and flatware. I actually think in this example, this person has their thumb touching the plate. So it may not be a food safe practice. And also wash your hands often. I cannot stress this enough, especially if you're dealing in any way with money um, or cards or machines in some retirement communities is something you really want to consider. But whether you just touch your face, um, touch the tray, you always wanna wash your hands often. So I've talked a lot of through the flow of food and I mentioned even through this presentation a lot about personal hygiene. Um, and as I said, a lot of personal hygiene practices can help eliminate physical and biological hazards. So wearing hair nets and beard restraints. So this is a very good practice for preventing hair and any other, um, you know, things falling into the food. Um, I know myself, my hair falls out very easily. So I'm constantly wear a hair net whenever I'm visiting a healthcare facility. Um, avoid wearing jewelry and artificial nails. So again, they can fall into the food, but they can also harbor um, bacterial hazards. And I'll kind of go into detail on that next. You wanna keep your nails short and clean and no nail polish. Again, it seems like we're being very um, strict when it comes to this, um, but really it all has to do with food safety. Keeping your nails short can make sure that there's no bacteria hiding underneath the nail while you're serving or cooking, and polish as well can chip and get into the food. You also wanna cover all cuts and sores with bandages and gloves. So again, I talked about the staff infections that can be um, present in infected cuts and wounds that could be on your hands. That can very much be an issue. It's also very common to cut your hands within a kitchen if you're not being careful. Um, as well, if your hand is cut, it's very difficult to wash your hands with the same force that's needed to get rid of all the bacteria. So make sure you wash your hands as best as you can and cover with bandages and then gloves. Again, wash your hands often, even with glove use, even if you don't have a cut in your hand, you wanna make sure that you're washing your hands, putting on the gloves, taking off the gloves and washing your hands again. You always want to be aware of potential cross-contamination with glove use. I find there's this false security when people wear gloves. They think that because their hand is protected by a glove that they're truly not touching the contaminant. So it's, it can be very often seen that someone wearing a glove can touch a piece of raw chicken and then touch a surface somewhere else. And just because their hand is protected, they're not realizing that they're spreading those um, potential microorganisms. So please be aware of that. I just wanted to talk a little bit about wearing jewelry. <clears throat> As I mentioned, our skin has bacteria on it, so it could be bad bacteria, such as Staphylococcus aureus, but it could also have good bacteria that does play a vital role for our health and protecting us. So although it's common, so I have this example here of a celebrity chef, they constantly wear jewelry, but this is because they're on TV. Jewelry can be a real hazard in the kitchen or in dining rooms. Not only can it fall into the food, but they can be vessels for biological hazards as well. So let's look at two scenarios. 
Scenario one, so the cook will cut raw chicken on their cutting board and then mechanically they scratch their ear. They're not even aware of it. It's just kind of a motion that they do, but they didn't realize they just deposited a large amount of salmonella on the lobe of their ear. Immediately, the microbial flora are good back present on their skin will do its job by helping prevent salmonella from settling in. It even may eliminate it in, entirely, or at least in part. Scene two, so imagine the cook performing the same work, but wearing an earring. What's going to attack the salmonella on the earring? There's no bacteria there. So as the salmonella is touched to the earring, it is not disturbed, it will multiply, multiply, and contaminate their hands every time they touch their ear. And it really must be said, you rarely wash your ear during work. So two hours later, that cook will then make sandwiches. Unconsciously, they scratch their ear and continue to work without washing their hands since they made just such a mechanical, like unthinking gesture. And as a result, they're gonna contaminate all of those sandwiches with millions of salmonella. salmonella. This is a typical case of cross-contamination. So again, we don't put these policies in place to be mean. It is protecting those that we are serving. And as I mentioned again and again and again, it's recommended that food handlers wash their hands often. This means after using the washroom, when returning from work, handling raw food, touching their hair, face, or body, after sneezing or coughing, after smoking, chewing tobacco, or chewing gum, after eating and drinking, cleaning, taking out the garbage, or any other activity or instances where their hands may become soiled. It's also important to use proper hand washing technique. As demonstrated here, you want to wet your hands, apply soap, lather and scrub for 20 to 30 seconds, rinse in warm water, and dry your hands and then turn off the tap of the paper towel to prevent recontamination. It's important to wash between your fingers and the tips of your finger, especially after using the bathroom. I also wanted to mention the importance of moisturizing your hands, especially during drier months like the winter or in drier climates, say as Alberta. There's a kit that you can purchase that can help educate with hand washing, and it actually requires that you put a fluorescent powder on your hands, wash your hands normally, and then use a black light to see where any area that was missed. When using this kit, in my experience, even individuals who use proper hand washing technique had areas that still accumulated the powder. And it was noted that these were areas on their hands that had dry skin. So it's really just as important to moisturize regularly as it is to wash your hands. Just a few points here about cleaning and sanitation. There's a distinct difference between clean and sanitary. Clean typically means free from visible soil, food residue, or other foreign material, while sanitary means free of harmful levels of contamination. It's really important to understand the, the difference because clean food, equipment, and utensils may not be sanitary. For example, a clean glass could be sparkling, but it may still carry harmful bacteria or chemicals. Whereas after being washed in boiling water, the same glass may appear cloudy, watermarked, not clean, but it is, in fact, sanitary. In most healthcare food service operations, dishwashers are used to sanitize and clean dishes, utensils, and pots and pans. Some dishwashers use heat to sanitize, whereas others use chemical. Heat sanitizer means that they use water that reaches a very high temperature to wash the dishes. You can check the thermometers on the machines, or you can use what are called heat sensitive stickers that can be placed on plates to determine if the machine reaches the minimum temperature required to sanitize the dishes. I think it's really important to tell staff the importance of making sure that this piece of equipment is functioning properly. As if the dishwasher is not coming up to temperature, the dishes are not sanitized, increasing the risk of contamination. Most chemicals used in the kitchen area must be food safe. However, there will be chemicals used throughout the facility that are not food safe. It's important to store all chemicals in a separate locked area to prevent them from intentionally getting into food. I also wanted to talk about outbreak procedures, and that's because during an outbreak, it's definitely not business as usual. There may be some different procedures that you need to consider. For example, does it affect the delivery of food? We had one example in Quebec where one of our drivers was dropping off a regular food delivery at a healthcare facility and they were completely stopped at the door because the facility was in an outbreak situation. So obviously the residents that still live there need a food delivery. So you might want to consider, do you need to contact 
um, your food suppliers? Do you need to consider a different entry route for the food to come in through the facility? Um, are there things that you really need to consider? Do you have proper sanitizing chemicals? So one example is actually Norwalk virus. There's a lot of food safe chemicals that can actually not kill this virus. So there'll be instances where you may have to use non-food safe chemicals in areas where residents may be, such as a dining room, in order to properly kill this virus and prevent it from spreading. You really have to make sure that when using these non-food safe chemicals, that they are completely dry before a resident touches it or even before um, the food is placed in that area. Also, you may want to concern, do you have to adjust your meal service? So sometimes you may have to serve a unit that is in an outbreak last. And even when you do that, you still have to sanitize the cart when it comes out of that area. And just making sure that you're not spreading the outbreak through contamination with your food cart or other food activities. So let's chat about some best practices and tools for continuous staff training. I really wanted to emphasize that it's important to have policies and procedures in place because it can really help eliminate or reduce the risk of some of these hazards when it comes to food safety. Again, personal hygiene policies and procedures can help reduce cross-contamination, physical hazard, and biological hazards. They can include no fake nails or nail polish, no jewelry, how hairnets must be worn, Uniform use, so make sure your staff are not wearing their uniforms on the bus as they're coming into work. And having procedures for cuts and illnesses to make sure, again, that there is no contamination. You may want to have um, procedures such as temperature logs in place. So have a procedure for taking food temperatures, making sure that the right temperatures are being taken and being recorded. Often you can work in a facility where you may have what the proper temperature is written next to it, and you'll see that the full list of items are just at the proper temperature that they think. Well, we realize that's a little unrealistic, so make sure you're writing down the actual temperature. Not only can this help us with quality concerns, so if there's a complaint about the roast beef, we can see, well, it was cooked to 200 degrees. That might be why it was overcooked. But as well, it helps make sure that those minimum temperatures are reached for food safety hazards. You might want to also have a log for your holding units, so your hot holding units, your cold refrigerators for your sandwiches, to make sure that they are maintaining their temperature throughout the day. Because as I said, if they do not, are not within those temperatures, you will have to take corrective action. So you may have to remove that food from the fridge and put it to another fridge. Again, having these in place too, they, they help staff just understand that it's not about writing down the temperature and walking away. Often I would find some temperature logs that would say, oh, the fridge was below or above four degrees and they just wrote it down and went on with their day. It's, you have to understand that there, these are trigger points that you now have to do something. So looking at logs for dishwashers as well, are those meeting the right temperatures? If not, you may have to take action and logs for fridges and freezers. There's even some fridges and freezers now that are on like an alarm-based system that will, an alarm will sound if they're not within range. Again, these types of procedures can help reduce cross-contamination as well as biological hazards. Lastly, you could look at cleaning and maintenance, and certainly these are only a few examples that I have pulled here. So having a regular maintenance schedule to make sure that your um, chemicals and sanitizers are functioning properly. So just making sure that this equipment on a regular basis is working the way it should. Having a procedure for your chemical storage um, and having regular cleaning schedules for deep cleans of the kitchen can be ways that can help reduce cross-contamination as well as chemical hazards. Another tip I kind of wanted to mention is posters and signage. Reminders really go a long way. So having posters in relevant locations, so having your te temperatures for food safety next to the oven or wherever you're taking temperatures, um, as well as a cooler storage chart, having that in the cooler, hand washing sign above your hand washing sink, um, all of this will help reinforce um, food safe day-to-day -day practice. 
as well, you may want to change the location or maybe freshen up the poster every once in a while because this helps keep the visuals top of mind. So if you, you know, having issues where the freezer door is being left open, maybe change that sign, change the color, just have something that's kind of fresh so that it brings attention. Lastly, I have a few tips for food service managers. It was noted by participants in a study of surveying food service workers of very aged generations. Um, they knew that it was important to have food service managers that held employees accountable, who were able to provide food safety information when asked, and who were available. So although I know you managers may be very short on time, and I certainly know that from personal experience, being consistent with your policies, being able to answer questions in the moment, and being present on the floor can really go a long way. I also wanted to mention the importance of doing regular audits. Although there are extra tasks, they can be very important ways to engage staff with why certain policies and procedures are in place. This can be done with on-the-spot education as well as during staff meetings. I know myself, so when I had to implement changes to the forms and times of recording the dishwasher temperature in my facility, I explained why this is important, that the dishwashers were reaching this correct internal temperature. I also talked about what should be done in instances when it's not occurring. So if it's not coming up to temperature, then we maybe have to switch to paper products until that is repaired. Otherwise, again, as I said, it may just become another task just to write the temperature down rather than think about it and take action when needed. It's always best to explain the why. I just also wanted to mention some ways our GFS can help. So we do have posters, some of the few I just had up there. Um, they all also are, a few of them are attached in the handout section. You can ask your sales rep if you'd like um, copies that are large that can be posted in your kitchen. We also have what's called a getting ready for inspector checklist. This can help with a on the spot internal audit. So if you wanna take this tool, do a little audit of your kitchen and see where you might be, especially before the inspector comes. You're also very welcome to ask us questions. So the Nutrition Resource Center um, can help you. You can call us toll free. As well, you can email us at nutritionrc at gfs.com. I also wanted to mention that coming very soon, we are launching a national food safety training program with official certification. So um, stay tuned, that's coming sometime hopefully in summer 2019. So if your food safety training is in need for renewal, just know that you may be able to come to GFS for that very soon. So thank you very much. That concludes our presentation webinar for today. If you'd like to ask some questions, please do so now. So I have one question here from British Columbia. And they're asking why um, eggs with runny yolks cannot be served in healthcare facilities or like a long-term care facility. This is a great question. It actually has to do with the fact that eggs to prevent any harmful bacteria to be um, eliminated as much as possible, eggs must be cooked to 165 degrees Fahrenheit internal temperature. And the proteins in the egg yolk actually coagulate or become solid when they reach this temperature. So if you serve an egg with a runny yolk, it actually could potentially contain harmful bacteria. And while this does seem like an issue um, with, you know, for something you may do at home all the time, I eat runny egg yolks all the time, um, because my immune system and I'm not in a vulnerable population per se, um, this is something that Although it doesn't affect me, it can greatly affect them. So we're just doing our best that we can to protect vulnerable populations. Are there any other questions out there?
Is it possible to have the link to the webinar after this presentation? Absolutely, we will be recording this session and you can send this out. It's a great tool if you enjoyed it today and want to show your staff, um, certainly do so, get a group of people together. It's a great way to spread some an in-service. The checklist for inspectors, um, it's, it's located in the handouts right now, so you can download it if you like, but if you um, forget to do that, certainly contact your representative. They can provide that to you as well. How to clean chicken if not rinsing it with water? It's also a good question. You really don't have to. So, um, you know, you can pat it dry with paper towels, um, and that just, you know, sometimes helps the skin dry, but it's really not necessary to wash the chicken prior to cooking it. Making sure that it reaches that internal temperature will ensure that any harmful bacteria that is on the outside um, will not be present. Is there a certain beard length when a beard cover should be worn? Not necessarily. Um, I would say if there is a beard present, it's best to do so. Um, I mean, it, it is very obvious that something like an eyelash or a nose hair can also easily fall into food too. But it's, it's also that you're potentially touching your beard. So whether it's, you know, itchy or just mechanical, by touching it, it's not only a physical hazard, but again, by touching the hair, it may not have that protective bacteria that's on your skin. So it could just tend to multiply on the hairs. And then if you touch your beard again, it just is a risk for cross-contamination. So any length, truly, I would wear a beard, a beard guard. We'll do one last call for questions. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions, but thank you so much for attending. As we said, this is being recorded. We can send this webinar session to you. Should you need so, just contact your representative or the Nutrition Resource Center at nutritionrc at gfs.com. Thank you so much.